All right, guys, we're gonna go move. We're gonna move on. Um, so my talk's just gonna be on uh, hip dislocations. For anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Mininder. I'm one of the uh, fourth years. You get email. So two main objectives today: just kind of identify the different types of um, native hip dislocations. There's, you know, it's different when you have prosthetics, but um, and then just like we'll go through a couple of methods on how to reduce them. So in general, the hip is a very strong joint, right? So you've got, uh, it's a pretty deep socket. Um, you've got a lot of ligaments there, uh, most notably the iliofemoral ligament. Uh, and your hip muscles are pretty powerful uh, in general. So if you do see a hip dislocation, think of it as a red flag. It's not, these aren't that common. Um, look for other injuries because it's a pretty significant mechanism. So go through your ATLS, kind of look at, like look for other joints, the knee. Um, but focusing on the hips itself, how would you actually classify them? Uh, so if we look back here, the femoral head and the acetabulum, if you just look at these two on an x-ray, it's the relationship of the femoral head to the acetabulum. So posterior, you'll have the femoral head pushed back out of kind of its socket. That's most of the ones that we're going to see are probably going to be posterior. Um, you can have anterior and they actually have two separate classifications for them, uh, which I don't... Um, you know, it can go superiorly towards the pubis, they're called pubic dislocations, it can go inferiorly towards the obturator foramen, and those are called obturator dislocations. But again, just and for us, I guess, uh, like as quick ones, just posterior, anterior. The third type, which is even more rare, uh, is if you have an actual fracture of the acetabulum, and it'll go through it. So if you look over here, this one, there's a fracture of the acetabulum, and the actual femoral head has been pushed through there. There's also uh, another entity like fracture dislocations, such as the central one where you have a comminuted fracture of the acetabulum or a fracture <laughs> of the femoral head. These are not the ones that we're going to focus on. These are not the ones that you want to be pushing in yourself right away. You may want to get ortho, you know, think these through. But so posterior hip dislocations, almost always secondary to like high speed MBCs. Um, so, you know, you're sitting in a car, kind of your hip is adducted, right? So they're both together. Your hip is flexed and internally rotated, right? You're probably sitting with both, both legs close to one another. Your knee hits the dashboard, kind of the force pushes, it kind of goes through like your femoral shaft into the, the femoral head, and it just pushes past that. Um, anterior dis hip dislocations, it's a little bit different, right? So your hip is adducted, you're probably, it's a little bit out. You may be externally rotated like you're walking. And then between the two different types, it's between uh, superior and inferior, it just depends on whether you're extended or flexed at the time of the injury itself. Um, so this can sometimes happen in actual like uh, football injuries as well. Let's see if these videos will work. You can see this one. And then you can see his leg. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Not fun. Uh, <laughs> so po back to posterior hip dislocations. Um, so what are you going to see when you see the person? Right? So this is kind of what they're going to look like. Their hip is going to be flexed Right? Uh, and again, this is all going back to that first image of like the kind of the muscles. So your hip is out of the joint, so it's basically going to be whatever the muscles are doing. So your hip will be flexed, you know, it'll be adducted, right? And it'll be internally rotated. So, uh, or sorry, also the knee may actually be sitting on the other knee just because of how it's internally rotated. The extremity itself will look a little shortened, so kind of like your hip uh, fractures. Uh, and then sometimes because of the internally rotated, you may notice like the greater trochanter is a little bit more obvious or their buttocks might be more prominent too, if you're looking. Um, anterior hip dislocations, on the other hand, will look a little bit different. So the hip will still be in a little bit of flexion, but they're going to be abducted, right? So it's going to be out. Uh, they'll be externally rotated, uh, and then the extremity may actually look a little bit longer. Uh, so, you know, what are you doing? You're suspecting these. What are you getting, obviously? Trauma bay, you're probably going to get your portable AP pelvis, right? Uh, so that's like an example of a pelvic film right there. So, um, you know, we already talked about the femoral head. You might see it posteriorly, you might see it anteriorly, and then that's that. Now, the AP pelvises don't always catch it. So what are other things you can look for on the actual x-ray? So the lesser trochanter, right? So this little thing right here. Um, in a posterior dislocation, remember we said it's internally rotated, right? So your lesser trochanter is going to be a little bit behind the femoral shaft, so you may not actually see it. Uh, so if you're not seeing it, then you may want to think about um, a dislocation. Whereas in an anterior uh, dislocation, your leg's going to be externally rotated, so the lesser trochanter is actually going to be more prominent. Uh, another thing you can look at is the femoral head itself. Again, if you see it out, you have your diagnosis, right? But if you don't, 
In a posterior dislocation, it's going to be closer to the actual cassette. So in an AP film, it's going to look a little smaller, the femoral head. Whereas in an anterior, it's going to be a little bit further away. So just kind of the way they shoot the x-ray, the femoral head may appear a little larger. Then there's this thing called Shenton's line. Um, okay, so it's basically a line that goes from the neck of the femur to the superior pubic ramus, like this. And if you look over here, you could follow it up like this. Man, my hand is shaking a lot. <laughs> uh, if you see over here, it's disrupted, right? So if you have disruption, think about some sort of pathology. In a hip dislocation, again, think about either the femoral neck or, uh, or the hip being dislocated. In this case, it's disrupted, but this picture is just really bad arthritis, so can happen from other things too. Uh, and again, obviously, anytime you have a dislocation, you always want to do a good neurovascular exam, right? So posterior uh, hip dislocations, focus on your sciatic nerve, your femoral vessels. Again, this is your acetabulum, your femoral head. You push your femoral head backwards in a posterior dislocation, your sciatic nerve kind of runs right there. Um, so 10% of people will have this. Uh, the most commonly, it's like the peroneal nerve branch, which apparently does like the external halicus longus for like the one or two of you that forgot where that was. <laughs> this is that muscle right here. So you can see where it's connecting. So what are you gonna see? You'll see a weakness of their extension of the big toe. So if you ask them to actually extend their big toe, it's gonna be a little bit harder. Uh, they may have a little uh, weakness dorsiflexing that foot and the numbness and tingling may be over the dorsum of the foot. Anterior dislocations focus on your femoral stuff. So, you know, just kind of your femoral, whatever your femoral nerve dis distribution is, your femoral vessels, those are the ones you really want to be careful about. Uh, all right, so who cares about this type of stuff? <laughs> uh, so orthopedic emergencies, right? If you look at all these like random orthopedic emergencies, there's not that many hip dislocations you can see is one of them. Uh, so again, we're talking about no fractures. We're talking about only hip dislocations. You want to reduce them in the ED. Um, these are ones you're going to probably use procedural sedation. I don't know if we're gonna really going to be able to get away with blocks per se in this one, but uh, you have about like six hours is what the textbooks will say. Um, you're going to, beyond that, you're going to increase your chance of having like avascular necrosis, uh, and then you'll have like, you know, worsening arthritis, the sciatic nerve palsy may become permanent, and just like joint instability in general. So how do you actually uh, reduce them? A whole bunch of methods. We're going to go through them real quick. I'll take questions afterwards. Just let me, um, just for the sake of time. Oh, All right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Alice technique, right? So the pictures again. Pictures will be a lot more uh, easier. But basically, your patient, you'll have them laying supine. This one doesn't have it, but you should have a second person stabilizing your pelvis. Your knee is going to be flexed, right? And then you're going to bring the hip up to 90 degrees of flexion, and you're going to be pulling up. So you're going to be giving like gentle traction kind of up here the whole time. And then while you're doing that, uh, your assistant's going to be pushing the greater trochanter. And then you, the movements you can make are right here. So you could kind of turn um, the femoral head, you know, left, right until you kind of get it in place. And then a quick uh, video on that. So is posterior or anterior? The, this can actually be used for both. Uh, this is for the obturator, uh, for anterior or obturators or posteriors. So again, knee flexed, hip flexed, pulling up and then turning and bam. Mm. You don't want to walk away like that though, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> then there's the Stimson's technique. And then uh, you guys probably remember the name from like shoulder dislocations, right? This is the one where you have them lying over with the weight. So it's the same type of principle. You're using this one, you're using the weight of the leg itself and gravity to help you out. So this one, this seems like a little bit Im a little bit harder to do in the ED, because like you, you're going to have to have your patient prone, right? You're already you're using procedural sedation. You're going to have the patient prone. You have their leg hanging off the bed. A little bit harder, but... They have other injuries, too. Right, right. and if you, again, like it's a, big, it's a big mechanism. You know, your trauma patients, how many times do we turn them prone? You're so worried about the spine. Uh, but, you know, if, if it is their only injury, it's an option. So they're, they're hanging off the bed, their knees flexed, their uh, hip is flexed. Again, you have assistant again, they're stabilizing the pelvis for you. Now you're pushing downwards, kind of in line with the femur. And then again, that same rotating mechanism at the ankle. Uh, while you're doing that, your assistant is pushing down up here and you know, hopefully it should go in. Whistler maneuver, this one is for posteriors only. Uh, so this one, again, patient's lying flat, this one, you're putting your arm underneath the leg that you're worried about 
and you're grabbing the other knee with that hand. Then your other hand is holding their ankle. And then while you're doing that, you're just applying kind of the same downward traction and kind of internally, externally rotating as you need it. Uh, this video is a lot longer, but let's see if we can play it from the spot that we want. Okay. So, you've got your hip dislocation over here. Ah, oh, man. We missed it. <laughs> Alright, so... Ah. Sorry about that, guys. Okay. So you can see his hand is underneath, right? He's holding onto the other leg. And this one, he just pulls it over. But this is what you want to do afterwards. You want to really kind of extend both legs, double check, and then walk away. <laughs> um, this is kind of the most, uh, I guess, ED friendly one. Uh, people just love the name of it, Captain Morgan. Basically, your patient is lying flat, right? Again, you have an assistant holding the pelvis. Your knee is flexed. This one, you're putting your own knee on the bed itself, and you're putting your knee underneath the patient's leg, distal to their knee. One hand is grabbing their knee, and the other hand is grabbing that ankle. Uh, and then you're using your knee, you're picking up your knee as the traction, and then you're, you're pulling down and rotating kind of the ankle with your other hand. So this is why it gets its name, as you can see. This is kind of the Captain Morgan stance, and that's kind of what she's doing. So two quick videos on it. He does, he's not doing it properly in that he's not putting his foot on the bed, so it's a little modified, but... Right. <laughs> but again, you see that knee, so these guys usually have other injuries that you want to be careful about. Now, the rest of this he does well, though. You want to range that hip completely afterwards to see if you're actually in, right? And now the other person over there is putting her actual knee down. No. And then she gets <laughs> super excited. <laughs> so, in the rare event that you can't get it in, you have two options. They can go to the OR and just do it under general anesthesia for better kind of relaxing of the muscles. Or, worst case scenario, orthopedics may have to do it open. Um, you do want to avoid multiple attempts in the ED. Usually, like, two is the number that most places are saying. Uh, Gruber actually wrote a whole chapter on this, by the way, so he's going to, like, call me out on things afterwards. But, um... You do want to avoid multiple attempts because you can damage the articular surface if you keep trying. Uh, and it, it has been shown to increase the incidence of osteonecrosis. But then again, not getting it in also does that. So, you know, weigh your risk benefit, obviously. See where you are. See if you have ortho available. And if you can't get it in, it's usually just due to, like, something actually being caught in that space. So be it the tendon, the capsular structure, or some sort of osteochondral fragment. Uh, again, what do you do afterwards? Test the, knee, test the hip, make sure it's actually in. If it's stable in a posterior one, you may put them in a knee immobilizer. In an anterior one, you'll use these abduction pillows. I don't know if we actually have these around in the ED, but you can always call ortho here. Uh, you want to check your repeat portable film, obviously. Uh, these are the things we talked about before, right? Make sure your femoral head is actually inside the acetabulum. Make sure that shaft looks now, uh, is now in neutral position. The lesser trochanter in a posterior, again, remember, you're not going to see it. So now it should be visible because it's not internally rotated anymore. Uh, and then just check your intraarticular space. So that's that Shenton's line we were talking about. Make sure that thing's back. Uh, and then most of the time, you're going to probably get a post-reduction CT hap just because you want to make sure that there's no actual femoral head fracture. You want to make sure there's no actual fragments in there. All right. Um, yeah, so just you're saying, like, don't reduce until you first rule out fracture. Right. How far do we go about chasing that? Because, like, a couple weeks ago, we had a patient, um, old lady, hip pain, x-ray negative, didn't feel right about it, got the CT, and showed, like, a comminuted displaced femoral neck fracture. So, like, how often are we doing CTs pre-reduction? to rule out fracture, or are we usually just going with the x-ray and that's good enough? So, again, it all depends on like your clinical suspicion of it. So if you get your x-ray, and it's in that case, your x-ray is negative, right? So then that's different, right? You're going to go further, uh, and you looked at all those other things, like Shenton's line, all those other random things, and it's like, ah, oh, this, you know, it's not fitting that dislocation pattern. Yeah. Then you'd go further, obviously, more imaging if they're stable. Um, if you're getting your x-ray and it shows a dislocation, I mean, shows a dislocation but no fracture, fracture. Is it sensitive enough to try the reduction? Um, I would, um, yeah, Gruber would too. Yeah, because I think at that point, right, you know you have an orthopedic emergency. 
It's worth trying. Again, you try twice and you're not getting it in, then you've got to start worrying, oh man, maybe there is a fracture, maybe there's something that's actually pushing in, then you may need the CT or you may just need ortho to take them up and do it open. Um, so is, if somebody does have a femoral head fracture, then you just leave it alone? No, the then... That, like, you know, cause you yeah, say, right. Then, so that's not one that I would rush to do in the ED. That's one I would consult ortho and then come up with a plan because then you're going to need your backup if you can't get it in. Because the problem with the fractures is you may push that segment inside the space and now that's going to be a bigger issue than just having the dislocation in the first place. So those I would just consult ortho because eventually they're going to be the ones who are going to have to yeah. deal with this, right? So that I would make a plan with them. What about those as a type of fractures? Technically those become pelvic fractures. Right. The CT scan to further evaluate. Yeah, so again, acetabular fractures was again one of those things, right? Fracture dislocations, so a lot of these, the fracture dislocations, those aren't ones you're rushing to put in yourself right away. That's going to be another one where you may need uh, ortho because you, you know, you try to push it in, you may push the acetabular main or you may break pieces and put it in the actual joint. So not one I would rush to do in the ED as well. But you would do a further trauma evaluation in terms of like a CT of the pelvis to evaluate, further evaluate the pelvis? If they're stable, yeah. I mean, if they're pulseless, again, you got to do your neurovascular exam. It all depends on the scenario, right? So if they're pulseless, then you may push one thing above the other. But if it's just dislocated slash fracture and they're stable enough to go get further imaging, and that's what your, you know, managing, co-managing service wants, that may be the way to go. Yeah. Sorry. You know, as you said, oh, sorry, most, most dislocations are posterior. They're going to show up on an uh, AP pelvis, but an anterior dislocation you can miss unless you do a lateral view to see it or get a CAT scan. Right. So just remember, they represent a small um, part of the dislocations, but you can miss an anterior dislocation on just an AP view. Right. That's why you want to look at all those other things on the AP view, not just where the hip is, but a lateral, if you can grab it in the in the trauma bay, that would be awesome too. Kate? So hip replacement patients, I would again consult ortho. Um, they, the timing isn't as important. It's still very important, but that six hour window is a little bit different in hip um, replacement patients. They're actually like more likely uh, to have a dislocation. Um, but that one I would, that one I would talk to them because again, it's hardware. You don't want to be breaking any hardware that was put in there. Well, at least um, we had a case of a month ago um, where it was an old guy who fell and uh, it was a posterior dislocation of a replaced hip. According to the orthocostal that came down, uh, the dislocated uh, replaced hips are way easier to put in. Um, because they're like, I, I don't know exactly how it works, but they've made the space for them, right? Yeah. They've already kind of like it's hardware now. It's harder to break metal than it is to break bone. It's like apparently, a higher success rate, and it's like way easier to, to do it. Yep. Um, so good talk. The only thing I would add, and just to like reemphasize what Dr. Gruber said, just like know the limitations and the indications for your actual study. So in the actual trauma bay, your ex your pelvis is part of the primary survey. So. Really what you're doing is looking for sources of bleeding, so they're hypotensive. The one time where you are going to stop to do the hip at that time is if they are pulseless, but otherwise, you know, hypotension and source of bleeding yeah. are going to be That's part of your, remember, yeah, ATLS, you see a hip dislocation, you're not stopping there. You still got to, the patient, you know, look at the patient as a whole. It's a good point. Good. Awesome. Thanks, guys.